the chat on your screen. Can you close that? Perfect. Thank you. All right. It's starting to come in. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to get started in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, you can say hello in the chat box. Uh, please be sure to set your, your chats to send to all panelists and attendees. Good morning. Good morning, Ria. Good morning, Li Yuan, Han. Morning, Sophia, Mike, Peter, hello. Morning, everyone. We'll get started in just one minute. Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, logging on today. It is 10 o'clock, uh, exactly, so we're going to get started. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Cayley. I'm a marketing manager for National Geographic Learning, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this third and final session of a three-part National Geographic Learning webinar series on best practices for teaching online. Uh, today, we're joined by Werner Kuhn, a passionate English language teacher with particular expertise in the area of online education. Uh, and Werner is gonna present ideas for teachers that are faced with moving their classes from the physical classroom to the virtual world of online teaching. And today, he's going to focus on engaging young learners online specifically. Uh, thank you again for everyone uh, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope that this is a, a timely and informative webinar for you all and that you can get a lot from it. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take just a minute to introduce you to some of the functionality of the webinar platform, uh, which you can use to interact with the presenter and other attendees. Uh, today's presentation will be very interactive and we encourage you to take part in the discussion by using some of these tools. Uh, first off, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there are several different icons. Uh, the first button is the chat function. Uh, please use this to type your reply to any questions that the presenter asks during the session. Uh, and this is important. Please be sure to send your messages to all panelists and attendees, not just all panelists. Uh, this is to help make sure that you can send your message to the entire group and everyone can read your messages. Thank you, Andrew, for sending that reminder in the chat box. So when you're sending out your messages, make sure that you're not just sending it to all panelists, but you're sending it to all panelists and attendees. Thank you for that. Um, on the right, next one is the Q&A button. Uh, please use this to ask the presenter or hosts questions or to make a request. Uh, we'll do our best to answer the questions as they come in. Uh, there will also be an opportunity uh, to ask questions at the end of the session this morning. 
and you can use that uh, this function at that time. Finally, the last thing, uh, if you're having difficulty seeing the screen that the presenter is showing, um, please make sure that you you set your view to view options to set uh, to fit to window so that you can see the entire screen uh, as the presenter is presenting. That's it from me. Um, I am going to turn it over to Werner, who is, is again, she's, he's a, an expert in online teaching and uh, runs and manages his own school uh, in, in Jai in, in Taiwan. Uh, so thank you very much, Werner, for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to you and thank, and thank everyone again for joining. There he is. Good morning. Hey, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining me and National Geography this morning for this special series of webinars aimed at getting teachers online. Um, first of all, uh, anybody guess where's my hat from? <laughs> Difficult to see my hat, no way. Ooh, yeah, Mario World. We have some Mario fans here today. Great. Uh, Elmo, okay. All right, great. Um, and the reason why I'm wearing this hat, I will, I will tell you guys a little bit later. But let's first start with, with our webinar. <clears throat> so it will be impossible to talk about engaging learners without looking at attention spans. In this first section, uh, we take a look exactly at that. But first, Let's do a quick poll with you. In my poll, I asked, um, is it possible to refocus children in an online classroom? Okay, wow, it's great. 77% of you said yes, it is possible. I have some great tips for you guys also. A few of you said no. Well, today is my day to change your mind. And another few, around 18% said that it's highly unlikely. Great. In today's webinar, I'm actually going to show you guys some good ways to, to get your students to refocus, different things you can try to help them to help get them back from wherever they are. Okay, let us begin. So in today, um, like Justin said, I've been teaching in Taiwan for around about 19 years. During this time, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to a variety of teaching environments, which really helped me hone my skills into what they are today. About 10 years ago, I started focusing on digital teaching and how we can implement the riches that is the tool teaching into our everyday teaching. Three years ago, we opened a school aimed at digital teaching for both children and adults. Therefore, today, I'm here to share with you what I have learned during my time experimenting with digital teaching. But before we begin, let's take a look at what we will get out of today's webinar. First, we are looking at the effects of activities on attention spans that is followed by a closer look at some online resources with multiple demos of my own personal account. And finally, we'll conclude the session with specific activities of young learners and adults. All right, so let's dive in. First, our first topic for today is making the most of our time in an online lesson. Since online teaching is different from traditional classroom teaching, it becomes important for us to be more efficient in teaching online. Therefore, Let's look at a few things that we can do to make our lessons more efficient for students. So how do we focus students? And more importantly, how do we get them to refocus once their mind starts to wander? The first thing you can do is change the task. A good way to refocus students is to change the activity they are busy with. Knowing this helps when designing activities. A rule of thumb at my school is normally for young students, we do not go over 10 minutes per task. Another great way to go is to get physical. Uh, this is more for young learners. And what I mean by going physical is 
in the sense of getting them to move around. For this, a simple game like Simon Says or an activity song like Down by the Bay works well. Anything with, with lots of actions, things that they can follow teacher or do, will help them to refocus. Another great thing that we can do is give students a reason to pay attention. Now, this might sound a little bit harsh, but it is our most basic responsibility to give them a reason to pay attention. We do this by designing interesting, attention-grabbing lessons. In the online classroom, whenever possible, show them instead of telling them. Share instead of imagining concepts and always, always connect back to the real world since this is where they live. And the last one is you set the tone. So having, if you are having a bad day, then your day is about to get worse. Ever wonder why sometimes your students are as motivated as a garden gnome? The energy you bring to the class gets amplified 10 times and returned to you. If you bring enthusiasm and curiosity to the classroom, then you, your students will respond in kind. And that comes back to my hat that I was wearing today. I started that with my hat, which immediately started the conversation, where's my hat from, right? Which makes the whole class will be, will be like that. People will ask questions because we started like that. If you come to class and you start, you're in a bad mood or you tell your students, oh, okay, sit down, let's, let's get it done. The whole class, they will have that feeling and you probably won't get a lot done, right? So let's have a look at three sure ways to bring back even the most absent-minded learners. Now, the, it might seem overwhelming, however, it's not all luck. There are definitely a few steps we can take to prevent these bouts of concentration loss. One good activity that is guaranteed to get your students' attention is a catchy ride. Something like, like this. Now, this one is easy. It's just, it's just like rolly, rolly, up, up, up. Rolly, rolly, down, down, down. Rolly, rolly, clap, clap, clap. Rolly, rolly, hands in your lap, lap, lap. Okay. So it's very easy to remember, it's very easy to practice, but the trick to these activities are to do them when everything goes well in the class. So before you have to ever use them, you have to practice them. This way it becomes a habit when disaster strikes. This is a little familiarity to penetrate the boredom and snatch back their attention. Another, another great one you can use is a sound. Now, this can be anything as simple as, I'm going to show you guys here today. I, I have this little, I call them attention picks. And it has like, it's cute and it has like little buzzers everywhere. So by making these sounds, the, the students will come back from wherever they are. I also have a train whistle that I like to use. Um, it sounds like, this sounds like a train. All right, so when I blow this whistle, normally my students know that something is happening. And the last thing I have is these, these little attention buzzers. I've got a pack of four with different sounds. And basically they just, they look like this. And then you can, each of them have a different sound. So that's my bop up. I use that normally when they answer questions or you have more like, at the doorbell point and that one. All right, so all of these things, any sound that you can make will really help to refocus the, the students. There is only one sound that will not get their attention. And that is the sound of a yelling teacher. So at my, at my school, normally we use these other sounds to always bring the students back from wherever they are. All right, um, another one I say is to turn it up. Now here I mean, I say here bring your A plus game because being the awesome teachers that you are, you always bring your best teaching, in other words, your A game. Sometimes by changing the feel of the environment can also pull students back from whichever Animal Crossing island they are on. 
You can change your look by wearing a different hat, like I did today with my, with my Mario hat, right? Or um, maybe if it's science time, you can put on a lab coat or, you know, one of those crazy hair science weeks, right? Uh, you can dim the lights, make it, make it darker or any, any change to your environment will definitely break their attention so they can start focusing on you again. Um, in my, at my home studio, I actually have like, I will show you guys a picture now. I have like a bunch of different hats that I can use whenever, whenever it's necessary to, to do this. All right, so you guys can see here, like I have a bunch like, everywhere I go. If I go to Disneyland or I go to Universal Studios or even if I go to the moon market, I will always be on the lookout for something, something special that I can use in my conversation classes. All right. Now, let's take a look at how we deal with adults that, that also suffers from this. It might seem hopeless. However, it's not all lost. There are definitely steps we can take to prevent these bouts of concentration. One good activity that is guaranteed to get your students' attention is a sharing lesson. <clears throat> now, for sharing from time to time with my adult students, it is clear that my students are focusing on something other than what I'm doing. The best way I've found to deal with this is to change the topic completely. Sharing, sharing normally works best. Discussing restaurants and or current movies is always a good idea. Another thing that you can do is assign a direct task. Another, um, is another uh, sorry, another great way for a wandering mind is to use a task in a more creative way. Now, depending on what you teach, the task will change. For example, if I am teaching IELTS, the best activity to get my students back is to ask them to do a speaking question. Since most students speaking is the reason why they join the class, and most students fear speaking, this is really something that they will have to focus on and bring them back to concentrate on the class. Fair warning them. Using this technique too, too often will cause your students to lose interest. And then another one is to get with the times. Now, we can all agree that it is alarming how much time young adults spend on their connected devices. However, the one good thing is that we can harness this obsession to get them to focus. From time to time, it is a good idea to share some material from those social media sites, a video, a link, a story. For older students that are less focused on social media, share something like from the newspaper or maybe a popular news agency, whatever is popular in your country. However, at the same time, be careful to beat the dead horse. Take the current coronavirus, for example. Although it is a mainstream event, from time to time, it is refreshing to hear how a baby rabbit saves a bear. Okay. And later today, I will also talk a little bit more about these ideas and some activities that you can do, especially for adults. All right, now let's have a look at some of the apps and websites that can make your life easier while we teach online. The, this list that I'm gonna show you can be divided into three sections. Uh, LMS, apps, and websites. Let's first have a look at learning management systems. In this category, there are two services I would like to share. Please remember one thing. When you are using an LMS, you should get permission from the parents first. Normally, uh, many of these websites have, have permission slips that you can download and send to the parents because you will be putting, you will put, putting students' work and their pictures and things onto the LMS. So it's always a good idea to get parents' permission first. All right, the first one I wanna share with you guys is Class Dojo. Class Dojo has plenty of features that make this a good choice. Today, I want to share the ones that I normally use in my class. The main part of Class, of class Dojo is class story and portfolio. Class story is where I can share lesson plans and materials with students. 
and the portfolios are where students get a chance to share their work with their parents. And then finally, Class Dojo offers a reward system where parents and teachers alike can award or deduct points from students. Let's first have a look at the inside of Class Dojo. Uh, let me just bring that up here. Right, so this is the inside of my, of my class dojo. And um, you can see here on the left side, I have all my classes. And then on the right side, if you click on a class, you will go into different, different areas. The first one you have is all the students in that class and also with their scores, like their points you assign to them during the time. On the next tab, you have portfolios. Now here is normally where students can share their work. You can say three students here have something in draft, which means they're not finished yet. And then these are the other things that they share. Now normally for me, I will upload today's lesson plan. I will give it to my students and they must upload it here so they can see. And then students can also share their own things. Like here the students shared some reporting they made of reading. Uh, here we did a presentation in the class. So somebody shared that. Um, all different kinds. Sometimes we have a party and they will upload the pictures from the party. But all of this, all of the things in the portfolio is visible to the parents. So this is a chance where students get a, get a chance to share what they did with their parents. Then we have class story. Class story is more for teacher to students. So here I can share things with them. I can upload a photo, a file, a recording or even an event if I want them to remind them of something. And at the bottom here, the parents can like it or they can view it and you can also make some comments if you want. And then on the last side, you also have messages. Now this is directly for the parents. So here you can communicate with, with different parents. You can send them a message and they can answer you when they have some free time, all right? And then also Class Dojo has some other tools you can use. For example, they have a little toolkit that includes a timer, or you can choose a random student. You can help, you can ask Class Dojo to make groups for you. And they have like other things that you, they even have music that you can play in your class while your students are doing some activity. You can use it to take attendance. So I can, every day I ask my students to check in. So for example, if they are not here, you can make it red, or if they are late, maybe they came but they left early, or they are here today. So you can do all of that. And then also, that's, like I said, there's a timer, and the best part is, is this part, where they, um, they make these little videos about important topics, for example, a growth mindset. And then students, you can do this little three, I think it's three to four minutes videos that you can do with the, with the, with the students. It explains the, the idea to them. And then after you guys, you, after that, you can discuss a little bit. So this is always, this is also a good system to use for, for an LMS. All right. So let me see. The next one I want to share with you guys is Shobi. Let me just pull that up here. All right, now Shobi is another LMS that I also, we also use extensively. Basically the same, you assign your classes, and the students can log in. And then inside that, you can add your resources. Now, Shobi has two parts that is really impressive. The first one is the class discussion. So here, students can talk to each other or teacher can talk to students. Now, you can also use the class discussion to add things like 
any links you want the students to follow. For example, maybe I want them to join a Flipgrid or I want them to join uh, a puzzle. So I can post the link directly to Shobi and then all the students can click on there. And then once I've made my resources, I just give it a name and then I add it into the shared items box and from here everybody can see it. So this, this part I, I shared the Quizlet link with everybody and then I also added their homework for this week. So if you look at the homework part, so here the students can see exactly what I want them to do. So I'll first remind them of some things we have to, that must be done. This week's lesson plan. And then we get into the homework part. Now from here, I will first explain to them how I want them to finish the homework and then give them some, some tests. And the nice part about Shobi is they can actually annotate the lessons inside here. So for example, I can, I can write here and then the students can, they, they can write their answers actually on the notes right here in Shobi. Other things they can do is they can also highlight or they can erase. Okay. And then um, they can also, you can, they can leave comments. So for example, I can write something here and then leave it as a comment for them. I can add a recording note. So here I can, I can add recording notes for them. And then finally, I can add a text box. So I can actually type something here and then all students can type something for me, focus, okay. All right, so that is basically how, how Shobi works. And then on the other side, let me just get out of here. All right, then on the other side, as you can see here on the left side, you have this red circle and a paper clip. The paper clip means that students have submitted the work. So which means they finished it and they, they send it back. And the red circle means that the teacher has checked because as soon as you annotate that document, then it will create a red circle. So both teacher and students can see that uh, the other one is finished. All right, let's go back to our presentation. All right. So let's see, um, the next one I would like to share is, um, we talked about Shobi. Okay. Now, um, like I said, Shobi is also great for class discussions and can easily uh, share or join links to a Kahoot, a puzzle or Quizlet or something like that. All right, next is websites. Now for websites, um, I want to introduce two specifically. The first one is Edpuzzle. And Edpuzzle, it helps to break your video sections into a variety of questions, from open questions to more specific questions. Let me quickly show you this one. Edpuzzle. All right, so this is my Edpuzzle account. And first of all, I set up my, we set up our own, our own systems. Now you can set up your classes. So here are all my classes. And inside your classes, you can set up your students. So, um, and from here you actually, you have to, you can see their user's name and you can also help them to change their password. And then any assignment you assign to them that you can see from here. And it also has a grade book. So you can, for example, see that uh, this student, he spent four minutes watching this video, which is about, right, the video is about four, four minutes. And then how they, how they did for it, each video. So if you click on it, then it will tell you, like, you watch 100% of the video, how many questions was right. It will even show you, like, which questions were, were right or wrong or which ones he didn't attend. All right. So all of that is, Edpuzzle helps a lot with those kind of things. 
But what makes this amazing is you can take videos from a variety of sources, including YouTube, Khan Academy, National Geography, TED Talks, they all have videos here. And then you can add questions to this. So here was a little video about noun suffixes. And then you can decide, you can watch this video. And then you can decide how much you want to show of this. For example, the first thing you can do is you can cut the video. So maybe there's certain parts of the video you don't want to show them. The point of then you can cut the video into only show a specific part. The next part is you can create a voiceover. So maybe there is a, a part of the video that you want to explain in a different way. You can actually create a voiceover for that part to, to explain it in a way that you think your students will understand better. And then finally is the questions you can ask. So at certain points in the video, you can actually add questions. They have multiple choice, open-ended, or you can just make a note. All right, let me um, show you one that we made. So you guys can see right at the bottom, you have the little raindrops here. And this is where I put questions into my, into my presentation. And I also cut this down. This originally was like a 10 minute video and I cut it down to only four minutes. I'm only gonna play the first part and I want you guys to see what happens when it gets to a question. He lived on a farm sanctuary in Australia. In fact, he's the namesake of the sanctuary, which is called. All right, so as soon as it gets to the question, the, the, the video will stop and the students will first have to answer the question. So in this case, what two animals are framed in this clip? So they can type in their answer here. And then they can say submit. And then they can say continue. Which is called and then Edgar's they can watch Mission. The, the owner of Edgar's Mission taught Edgar how to. All right. So this is what it puzzles it puzzle is. It really helps to break down little, to break down video time. So students can get good quality from their, from their video. All right, let's. Um, okay. well, let's get back to our presentation. All right, so this was Ed Puzzle. The other one I would like to show is Mentimeter. And for Mentimeter, I actually want you guys to participate. So while I'm talking, you guys can go to mentimeter.com and then, or just menti.com and then just add in that code, 50, 53, 51. So another great resource, like I said, is uh, for control presentations is Mentimeter. And I use this quite a lot in my class for adults. Mentimeter allows me to advance slides one at a time. So I make sure that everybody is focused on what I'm doing. And whenever I advance the slide, it will change on my students' devices too. But it still allows for interaction with the student. So let's give it a try. So Mentimeter has two parts. So one part is what you see from, from my side. So this is the part that you will see on your phone, right? And then as people are answering, for example, what is the best activity to get students' attention? So I advance to the next slide, and then I add questions. Now, as people are joining this, and they, they add their questions, these this things will start moving. So for example, if you have 10 people and they, they start answering your questions, then they will start showing like, what is people's opinion? Okay. So in this case, we, we see that most people say that play an interesting sound or using it. Oh, you guys are really listening to me. I'm so happy. Okay. So you can see that this gives you a live update of what people's opinions are about your question. So once I think that everybody is finished, then I can move on to the, and it shows you at the bottom. It will show you how many people participated in this activity. All right. Then if I go to the next slide, 
So the next one is, what is one activity that is not suitable for adults? So then here I, is another kind of way to present the data. So again, people will vote like what is not suitable. And then as they start voting, then you will start seeing the data will start appearing on the screen. So this is especially, uh, I have used this a lot with, um, with uh, examination teaching because a lot of my students sometimes, especially adults, they're not, they don't really want to ask their questions because they are shy or maybe they will think other people think that this is not that good. But um, so I can use Mentimeter where they can ask their questions anonymously. All right, so that also helps them to get answers for their questions. Uh, so here we said engaging topics is the best thing to do. You can see how they how they point them out. All right. Then, so I can change the slide again. So what is another topic you would like to learn on Reddit online teaching? And then this is to show an, an open-ended question. So here, as students are typing in their, their responses, it will start showing up on the screen. And other students can see, and the, the examiner can also see. You see like cool activities. So as these things are coming in, they will start populating the whole screen. More apps. Kindergarten. How to produce teacher talk time. Crowd control. All right, so you guys can see that it goes through, and then you can start reading this. And the nice thing about this is that at the end, you can actually, when all of this is finished, you can go back and go check, like what was the response from, from your students? What is the things they want to know? What is the things they're asking? So you can help your class, you can adjust your classes accordingly. Okay, nope. Great, so let's move back to our presentation. All right, so that was Mentimeter, just a quick shot. So before we move on to the next section, I first wanna do a little chat box activity. Now the question I'm asking here is, what is your favorite resource to use and why do you use it? This resource can be either an app or a website, but it must be cross-platform. So in other words, it must be available for all devices. Let me bring up the chat box so we can see. All right, we have uh, Hangouts, uh, Zoom, Google Classroom, Quizzes, Zoom, Kahoot. Oh, Explain Everything is also good, yeah. learningchocolate.com. Kahoot and Quizlet, Matt, Geo, Keith, that is nice, yeah. Hmm. All right. Flipgrid. All right, so yeah, that's, um, so some of these things we covered today, for example, like Quizlet, I'm gonna show you guys a little bit later. And uh, I think Andrew mentioned Flipgrid. We are also going to have a look at that a little bit later. And I also have one surprise for you today. So next we are looking at apps. Now the apps that I normally use in my class, I chose, there, there's a lot, there's really, really a lot. But the four that I chose to use for this year is the ones you can see on the screen. And I chose these ones because um, my students and I, we really have a good time using these apps in class. 
Now, the first one I want to show is Flipgrid. Now, if you've been following this series of webinars, you know I, I mentioned Flipgrid a few times, simply because it's very versatile. It can be used for classwork, it can be used for homework, even for teamwork. In short, basically students record short videos, and then other students can also comment on their videos with more videos. So it's a really engaging platform, and students really like to, to, have, to talk to each other. Now, I want to share with you guys uh, one of my classes Flipgrid's account. Uh, this is the one for my ESL2 class. Where are you, Flipgrid? There you are. All right, so this is basically Flipgrid. You, um, let me see, I can. Basically, you have a grid. A grid is where you can put different kinds of topics. So, um, on the free account, you can only create one grid. But if you pay for it, I think it's something like five bucks a month, you can actually add different topics. Now, I created a topic for each of my classes. And then inside that topic, you can put questions. So, basically, I. Every recording I want to make, I make that as a question. So once I've done that, then here I can add my picture here, or I can make a little instructional video to explain to students what I want them to do with the instructions here. And then the students will, from this side, the students will then start to record from their devices. Now, the nice part about Flipgrid is, um, I want to show you guys one video. So the, the students will, the students will um, make their videos from their devices. And then you will be able to see it on your side and you can leave comments to them. Now, there's two ways to leave comments. The first way is, for example, the student, what makes this video special is this specific student that, that I'm going to show you guys does not really talk that much. But since we started using Flipgrid, he really, um, he really likes to make his videos and talk and share with other people. And he likes it when other people should talk about these videos as well. Don't stand or not snap in a tree. I have a baby. All right, so I asked them to, to, read, to make this reading for me. And then um, they don't have to be in one place to make the video. So this looks like the student's house. Maybe they paid it. But they can add like little decorations to their videos. And you as teacher can also do a lot. For example, you can give them a feedback by recording another video saying something about it. Or you can leave them a, um, a text feedback. For example, I can say here, um, good job. All right, and then the students will see that when they open their app. And it really makes them feel like um, they did well. So this is, the site you see here is actually a teacher's view. So if you go to, if you use a, a, a device, then you can actually see from the student's view how it looks. Basically, it's just one big green button and then they can record and make their videos. All right, um, back to our presentation. So that was Flipgrid. The other one I would like to show is called Nearpod. Now, it is very similar to Mentimeter, but in my own personal opinion, I feel that Nearpod is a little bit more suitable for children's English with the variety and activities they have integrated into Nearpod. That being said, I have used Nearpod with adults before with great success, but I wanna show you a quick demo of Nearpod today. Today's Nearpod code is O-U-L-R-B. And all you do is you go to nearpod.com and the section that says for students you add this code to that part
All right, so once you're logged into Nearpod, you should be able to see this screen, which says, let's work with W. The code is also here in the top left corner, O-U-L-R-B. All right, so at the bottom here, you can see that 11 students have signed up so far. And this part, you can choose to show student's name or to hide student's name. That's up to the teacher. For example, if I say here, hide, then it won't show the student's name in the presentation. Okay, now, as I change my slide, it will change on your device as well. Now, this is very similar, like I say, to Mentimeter. But now, the difference is here, you can you can uh, participate all right so the question i ask you is draw it in the background so i ask you to make a w so now you can do that on your device you can click and then do the w and then you can say submit as the students are engaging you can see from teacher's point of view you can see that oh this student is practicing and that student is practicing this one submitted already so you can see who is doing what Oh, you guys are really good with W. Your teachers will be very proud. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So again, you have like, um, here you have maybe have to write your own W. So again, the students can, can do that. And then, now we can practice lowercase w, and then finally you can even add other activities. For example, you can add the drawing activity. So here the students will have to circle all the words to start with w. All right, and then and the other thing about Nearpod is you can add a, a variety of content into these slides. So you can add a website or an open-ended question, a drawing activity like I just showed you. You can add another slide or true or false. They really have a lot of content that you can integrate into your lesson. They even have, <clears throat> they have things from Google Maps, like a, a Google Map flyover, or they have things from 3D, some 3D um, models that you can show in your class. This program is really, really comprehensive and it really can take the students on a very, very nice virtual tour. All right, so and then that is the end. So then they can say, oh, this, this is the end of the worksheet and then they can submit. So after everybody is finished, the teacher can, act, they, will actually down, they will actually download a report and send it to your email. So you can see which students did which things and how did it go. All right, um, back to our presentation. Sure. All right, so that was Nearpod. The next one I would like to show is, actually um, Kahoot and Quiz is very similar, but today I want to focus on Quiz because everybody already knows Kahoot. So, and I want to, I think Quiz is also a very fun activity to play. So let me pull that up quickly. All right, so this is quiz. Um, we're first going to play the game because we have a link for you to directly join. And then after that, I'll quickly show you guys how it looks. So if you go to the website that Andrew dropped there in the, in the chat box, then you can quickly sign, uh, sign in.
All right, so from the beginning, if, if students, uh, sometimes students will maybe put in the wrong name, you can actually click here to remove them, and then they have to re-sign in again. Okay, sometimes uh, some of my students will put like 5,000 emojis, so I will kick them out and ask them to re-enroll with their name so we can see who they are. All right, I'm going to start the game. So here, the, the, the whole point about quiz is you have to answer questions and ask. The faster you answer, the more you get right. It will move you around on the leaderboard. And then you can see, like, um, students get really excited because obviously everybody wants at the top. So they start moving around and see if you can stay at the top or maybe somebody will knock you down. But except for the fun part, this also, quiz also shows you how many of the questions your students answer correctly. So around about an, an 80 to 90% accuracy means they know the work very well. If you only have like a 20 or 30% accuracy, it means that that kind of work you probably have to go reevaluate. Wow, Shani is killing it. Shani and Billy and Missy. Good. So sometimes in my class I will use it, you know, like when um when you watch like a a horse race. So I will comment on the students like that and it really makes them excited because it's noisy at the first place and the second place is they, they get really nervous and they try really hard to stay at the top. But at the end of the day, it's really a lot of fun for students. All right. So basically, once the game is finished, then um, I can say end game. And then here it will show you like who was in first place, who was in second place. So we had A, Sean, and Billy. Congratulations. And then at the end, I will actually show you the overview, like which question students answered correctly and how many students got question one right. And so it will give you a nice overview of what is happening with your students individually. And they also have a part for questions. So they will show you like which question is most people answer correctly and which questions most people ask or got wrong. So it helps you to focus on, on those kind of questions. So this can really help you to improve the areas of teaching and make sure your students know all, all the content they should know. All right, um, let's go back. Okay, I'm gonna start this presentation here. All right, so that was, um, that was our quiz. And then the, last, the next one I want to focus on is Quizlet. Now, a lot of you already know Quizlet, and, but it's such a great tool to use than to help students to review their skill. I especially use Quizlet for vocabulary review. Normally, teachers will take turns typing out word lists for our books. And we use, because we use the series from National Geography called Explore Our World or Our World. And then teachers share these tasks between them because eventually when you get to that level, you will teach it and you will use it anyway. So it really becomes beneficial to share the tasks. But once the work lists are up and running, there has been, there's so many things that you can do and it really takes like a few seconds. Now as an added bonus for today's webinar, if you follow the link here at the bottom, I think Andrew will also drop it into the chat box. Um, if you go to Quizlet, this is the, Word list for Explore Our World One Level One's Word that I made public for everybody, so you guys can you can actually add it to your collection or use it and build from there to make more word lists. But let's first have a look at quiz. 
Slit. Okay. All right, so Quizlet, like you say, you can you can create your work list. So I created this. This is the work that I shared with you guys as well. Uh, I added my con my my vocabulary, a little explanation, and a picture. I like about Quizlet is clock. It An allows you to shows time. It reads the words for the students, so students can use that to get some visual uh, ordinary clues. And then you can do a lot from here. You have flashcards. Um, you can do learning activities, so students can test their skills. And you have writing activities. So basically you show them a picture and then they have to write what is that with the definition. Um, this spelling. So you have to type what you hear. Map. So in this case it says map and you have to type map. Now normally what I do with this is before we have a vocabulary test or before we have some kind of test, I will assign Quizlet as homework. My students will then go use it and they, they need to finish, for example, I will tell them like, you need to finish three different activities before tomorrow's test or before this week's test. So that I make sure that they practice those things. And that really helped us a lot to improve student scores. And you can go see, for example, so here is my students from, I think, uh, Monday's class and so I can go see which students they finished which activity so some of them already finished like for example Alex here he finished like almost everything and then somebody else like Amanda haven't done much yet so I can see exactly which of them is doing which things so in the next so when the next time next test come I can check like oh this student did well because they finished activities or this student must remember to, to practice more All right, and then you know, just like all the other programs, you can create your own classes. So I made a list of all my classes here, and then you can add sets. Another nice thing about this is also you can create sets and share with other, other people, or you can search for certain things. And then um, you can also use that. For example, if I search for explore our world, Then I can see there's definitely like obviously my set comes up and there's other teachers that's also teaching explore our world. And they already started making some work lists. So I can always go check, like, is this something that I can use in my class? And then I can copy their set and then add, just add things to that or take things away to make it more suitable for my class. So it really helps a lot to cut down on your preparation time. All right, um, let's go back. That is, All right, so like I said, um, these, are the, these are the eight apps that I like to use in my class. And that really helps, my, helps me to organize my online teaching much better and gives me good feedback about what my students are doing and how they are doing. And uh, because one question that we didn't discuss here today, but it's actually very true, is parents have more questions when they are teaching online because their perception of online teaching, many parents feel like how much can the students really learn? So it's really important that our evaluation of the our assessment of students are really accurate. And all of these things we did today really helps to exactly pinpoint every student's, every student's problem. All right, let's look at a quick poll before we move on to the next section. So my poll question is, is physical activities necessary for online teaching in young learners? And the second part, can adults benefit from these as well? All right, so the results are in. 
So part A, are physical activities necessary for online teaching? Um, yes, oh wow, 90% of you said yes. And 4% said no, and 10% said not sure. It is true, it is absolutely necessary. And I'm gonna show you some activities today why you should do it in your class. Because for young learners, they need to move. And then the second part is, can adults benefit from these activities as well? 89% 80, said yes, 2% said no, and 10, 30% said not sure. Um, for adults, it's a little bit more tricky, but there's other ways that we can physically um, get them involved. But obviously asking adults to jump around and dance, is not gonna be very effective. So I'm gonna show you some activities today for both children and adults and how we can help them to get engaged more better. All right, let's move on to young learner specific activities. Now, so far we have had a look at focusing and refocusing wandering mind. And we also looked at resources that can make the task easier. Let's quickly dive a little bit deeper at activities for learners and adults. Now, first we're gonna look at young learners. This level can be divided into two groups, kindergarten and elementary level. Let's first look at kindergarten. In kindergarten level, it's extremely important that students get up to move regularly. Any activities that get students to follow you or copy your actions have tremendous value in online classroom. The activities I introduce here is doing exactly that. For example, everybody knows teacher says, right? But another one you can play is called secret word. Now, I will put the secret word on my board and say, let's for example say today, I wanna to practice the word pigs. So I'll put it on the board and every time my students hear the word pigs, they will, they have to do something. For example, they have to clap their hands three times or they have to shake their bumble, whatever. Now you do this in the online classroom as well. You tell the students today's word is pigs. And every time they hear you say pigs, for example, they need to clap their head or they need to stand up and turn around three times. All right, so that, first of all, they have to really pay attention. And second, it helps them to practice that word. It helps them to get up and move around. Okay. Another good activity is called Copy Me. And this is specifically well, uh, works well for classroom management. In Copy Me, the students need to do everything that you do. So. If you say something loudly, they must read loudly. If you say something softly, they must do it softly. Exactly the way you do it. And this, this also helps them to really focus on your actions and the things that you do to make sure that they follow the class. If we turn our attention to elementary school levels, here, because their motor skills are a little bit better, so we can do more things. Uh, one thing that is great is annotation. They can, from circling pictures and highlighting words to actually answering questions on the board. And most, most uh, software will actually label who is annotating what. So after the students annotate, you can actually see, oh, this one wrote this and that one wrote that. Another great one is screen sharing. Um, here you can ask students to do something on their side and then share that with the whole class and maybe explain to us what they are doing. That also works well. And the last one, and probably my, my most loved one, is project-based learning. Now, project-based learning, or PBL, is when students, many students work together to finish one project. An example of this is, for example, let's talk about the coronavirus, right? Uh, so recently, I'm talking to my students about how to stay healthy. So I will divide my class into two, three groups. So I'll find one group, I will find two, they must talk about how to stay healthy. Another group will tell us what happens when we don't stay healthy. And another group tell us like um, why staying healthy is important. So each group has their own things. And then you can go back and use things like Flipgrid. Every group make their little video. And, or you can go back to Edpuzzle and let the students can show you some videos. There's a variety of resources we use today that you, you can go back and the students can incorporate all of this and make like a little presentation that the next online class that they can use screen share to share with teacher what they, what they have done. All right, now, just like kids, there are plenty we can do to refocus adults. So let's have a look at some of them. 
But before we talk about this, I first want to talk a little bit about adults. This is a little bit long, so try to stay with me here. Probably one of the questions I get asked the most is how do we motivate adult students? Now, I think it's important to remember that even for adults, we can still divide them into two different groups. The first group will be young adults. These are students from senior high school to university, and then the other group is working adults. These two groups' motivation is different for studying. That is important to know if you are going to motivate them properly. Let's first look at young adults. In this stage, they realize that this is important, but they don't have the self-motivation to do it. For, the, for this group, we need to encourage them a lot, and we kind of become problem solvers. We need to help them to solve the issues they experience in order to motivate them properly. Whereas for working adults, to motivate them, we need to give them quality for the money they spend. Every class needs to offer something they feel enrich their lives. And all of this without adding too much stress to an already tired or overworked person. Probably the most common gratitude we receive from working adults is, I feel attending English class is very interesting and a place to unwind after a stressful day at work. Now, knowing this, um, what activities can we do with adults? One of the best activities I found to keep students current is discuss things that are currently happening and work your lesson around that. Adults can be really reluctant to share websites or articles they have read. That responsibility normally falls on the teacher to prepare. Also, homework for adults seems to be a major point of frustration for both teachers and students. However, if you keep your topics relatable, you can get away with minor home assignments like go read more about something or share your favorite movie clip. So let's take a look at relatable activities. These are things that students can relate to. Their work, life, serious world problems, how much Monday sucks. When, when they can relate, they are much more likely to share their opinions and attend the class because there is value in it. Okay. So you can share a lot of things from here, from like this little memes I put up, like go away Monday. Everybody hates Monday. That's like a universal fact. And like little memes, like why is this baby famous? Things like that, because that is the thing that students are exposed to. So helping them to understand that is, is always a good idea. Another thing, great way to get students engaged and conversing is to share your own life. The things that you experience. Adult students like to see how, how you experience the world, especially if you are living in a foreign country. For example, everyone wonders what their English teacher is doing for New Year. Well, at least I hope so. So I will share some pictures with my students, like we went to a friend and we, we had a meal, or I took my dog to Starbucks, or I'm building Lego models. The students love to know what you are doing as well. Another great way is asking students about opinions they might have about certain issues. Again, remember to stay relatable. Asking their opinions about possibility of using corn biofuel in commercial flights might be a little bit too controversial versus their opinion on whether McDonald's should bring back the quadruple Big Mac. The difference here is that one they can relate to because who hasn't been to McDonald's yet this week? All right, and then the next one, another one to do, do wonders is debate. Now, for advanced class, this is a great idea. Students have time to prepare and can get a chance to practice their English. Make sure you give them all the materials they need for a successful debate. I normally choose topics that is currently in the news or when I want my students to keep an open mind about controversial topics. Some other topics I like to infuse include things like news topics, current events, things from our textbooks, or interesting social issues that has recently happened. Okay, so wrapping up, final thoughts. Give your students a reason to pay attention. If they feel the class is exciting and thought-provoking, they will want to stay present. Share your experiences. Share your daily lives with students. They are much more likely to respond if they feel some connection to you. Choose the right resources for your level. 
not all resources are created equal in terms of lessons. And then understand your students' needs. If you can understand their struggles and help them to solve some of their issues, that will go a long way in motivating to pay attention to what you have to say. Thank you very much, everyone. Great. Yeah, th thank you so much, Werner. That's uh, fantastic. We're getting a lot of good feedback in the chat box, as you can probably tell. Uh, people are really into it. I know I, I really got a lot. Um, really useful suggestions. And I even got practice on uh, how to write a W effectively. Um, we okay. do have, we're, we're a bit over time, so we might have to limit our Q&A uh, maybe just to uh, one or two questions. And I do want to hope, hope people can stick around for a little longer because we have some uh, good resources from National Geographic Learning that uh, people can make use of immediately in their class as well. Uh, so maybe we'll take it to the Q&A. We got some, some good questions, Werner. Um, you know, may, uh, one, one that I saw that I, uh, I liked before was, um, actually so, someone's asking kind of about, uh, about kindergarten. Uh, I don't know if you teach kindergarten yourself, but are, are there any kind of ways of keeping, um, activities or useful things for, for, um, authenticity, encouraging authenticity in the classroom? That's a question from, uh, Deepa Parekh. Um, for kindergarten is, um, you teach, uh, K4 and K5. Um, I'd like to give you on the um, kindergarten rule. It, it can be it can be quite tricky because uh, obviously we don't want to expose them to technology so early, but as we still have to to get things done. So with kindergarten, like I said in previous sessions, uh, we really have to limit down the time. Uh, short sessions, uh, maybe like a few minutes at one time, and then take a break from that. Uh, we actually, what we did before is we have kindergarten classes where we will we'll make it like maybe 20 minutes at a time. And then for 20 minutes, we will, we will work on something and we'll break and let them complete some things at home first. And then we, sign, we go back again for 20 minutes. And so basically we break it into small amounts of time and then just go from there. It's a little bit more complicated. And um, we also, for kindergarten, you also might need parents' involvement more often. Let them, like for example, let them finish an art project and ask the parents to help them to take a picture and then send the picture to you so you can evaluate it or something like that. That helps a lot to get the parents involved. Perfect, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll just take one more question, Werner. Um, yes. I, I can choose it or you can. Do you want to take a look at the Q&A? Uh, um, uh, Joyce says, where can we find some separate chat rooms for students' group communication for discussion? All right, um, many, of these, many, many of these software actually offer breakaway rooms. So within the main software, you can make a smaller chat room where students can discuss with each other. So that is always, um, you, you must really look at the software you're using and see if it's possible for, for that kind of function. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Werner. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I know we could probably ask you questions all day. These are really useful. Uh, but I want to be sure to send people off before they leave today with a couple of parting uh, uh, places to go where they can find out more. I see some questions in the chat box about, you know, wh when's your next webinar? What other things are there available? Um, yeah. We do have some uh, other things that are definitely worth checking out if you're, if you're looking for more resources or ideas for the classroom. Uh, Werner is showing now a, um, a web page uh, that it's called the Online Professional Development Resources page from National Geographic Learning. Uh, so National Geographic Learning is, is here with you as you're adjusting to your new way of teaching and helping your students uh, remotely. And there's a lot of resources that can help you as you prepare your online lessons. Uh, so on this website, which I will put into the chat box here, a link, uh, you're going to find things like um, other useful webinars for teaching online, uh, blog posts, uh, free downloadable professional development ebooks, uh, a lot of stuff for, for you as you're getting ready uh, and, and continuing to teach online. Please take a look at these resources. They're definitely useful. Um, next slide here is about our webinars. So that for those of you that are looking for more webinars, more ideas, uh, you can definitely uh, please go and check out what we have. We, we have a bunch of already recorded webinars that are, might be relevant and useful for you. And we also have upcoming webinars as well. So this is a link to our global um, webinar site. 
Uh, we have uh, folks at National Geographic Learning, teacher trainers, editors, authors, uh, occasional TED Talk speakers, National Geographic Explorers, and occasionally experts like uh, Werner who, who can help present uh, ideas that might be helpful for you as you're, as you're teaching uh, online. Uh, the next one is uh, we have a blog page as well. These are um, this is filled with a lot of really useful and practical uh, ideas to help teachers. Um, the posts are short, they're easy to read, uh, and they're good for you if you're looking for uh, classroom ideas on a variety of different topics. And some of these are very relevant and timely today. As you can see, uh, the latest ones are on tips for teaching online successfully and building online communities, etc. Last uh, slide from me is uh, please be sure to check back in on the National Geographic Learning uh, uh, social media accounts. We are on WeChat. We are also on uh, Facebook. Uh, so the, the URL for Facebook is here. Um, and for WeChat, you can um, look up NGL Fu if you're in, in China. And um, that please do keep in touch. We will be sending announcements and additional resources, et cetera, uh, to teachers. So we hope that you can come back, check in early and often uh, to, to find out when our next events are gonna be. And we hope we can see you there. Last, last thing for me, uh, there will be a survey that will go out immediately after this webinar. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, we'd like to get your questions, anything you want to please feel free to share there with us. Um, at the end of the survey, you'll also find a link to the recording of this webinar and the previous two webinars that uh, Werner presented on practical ideas for teaching online. So um, if, you're, if you're looking for the webinar recording, please keep an eye out for that email and be sure to uh, uh, fill out the survey and you'll, you'll be able to, to get the access to that. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I appreciate uh, everyone's taking their time this morning. Uh, hopefully some of this was useful uh, and we hope to see you again real soon. Thanks guys. Have a good day and thank you again, Werner.